morning, everybody. So uh, uh, I think Jeff described me as a uh, prolific investor. If somebody asked me to describe myself, I would tell you I'm a prolific bullshitter and uh, uh, one of the best to come out of Atlanta, Canada. And I should warn you, when I think I know more about a subject than my audience, watch out. So here goes. Um, yesterday, uh, it occurs to me that, that uh, we had this uh, you know, fabulous introduction from uh, from uh, two astronaut uh, two astronauts, uh, and today um, we're leading off with a guy who, uh, frankly, has to check to make sure that his fly's done up after he walks out of the loo in the morning. And I checked; I'm good this morning. Uh, um, and <clears throat> and yesterday uh, I found at least uh, those two opening uh, uh, talks very uh, inspirational. So we're going to switch from being inspirational to being crass and talk about uh, how we can make some money in Atlanta, Canada, uh, around the ocean economy. Um, so <clears throat> as you might imagine, and to some extent obvious, uh, the ocean is, is many things. Uh, it's threatening and scary. It's uh, peaceful and engaging. Uh, it's the world's largest source of protein. Uh, it's also its largest carbon sink, but in many ways it's, it's still a mystery, an enigma if you like. Uh, but most of all, uh, I want you to think of it as, a, as a, uh, an engine of economic opportunity. I got this right, where's the next button here? Did you see I'm good with this kind of stuff? Right? I got a new... Uh, Apple uh, Watch, I have no idea how to use it. Right? Struggle to even figure out how to tell the time. Uh, <clears throat> so just to give you a sense of the macro picture here, uh, the OECD uh, estimates that today the ocean economy is responsible globally for about $1.5 uh, trillion in economic activity. And by 2030, uh, 10 years from now, that is going to be over $3 trillion. So I ask you to think about uh, where else are those, there those kinds of uh, economic opportunities? A, mil, a trillion and a half dollars in economic growth um, in, the next, uh, uh, in the next 10 years. So what does this all uh, mean for, for Canada? Uh, see, I told you I'm having trouble. Is it the top one? This one here. Thank you. Um, so this is a, uh, um, the country on the right is Norway. Um, obviously, we're on the left, and Norway is an example of uh, what can happen uh, when you actually get this right. Uh, their ocean economy uh, last year was about $132 billion, which is 37% of uh, their GDP, and if you, think, if you compare that to, to Canada, um, the ocean economy was a paltry 1.5% of our GDP. Um, obviously, that's just not... Uh, good enough, and that 132 billion, by the way, in Norway, was bigger than our oil sands uh, industry, automobile, and uh, and aeronautics uh, put together. Um, <clears throat> but we've got a, a really important uh, stake here. Um, we've got, as many of you will uh, obviously understand, the largest coastline in the world. Uh, we touch three oceans. Uh, our Arctic frontier is the largest untapped. Uh, Arctic Ocean territory on the globe, and we've got some uh, important IP uh, to help sort of uh, turn that into economic opportunity, which I'll talk about in a minute. But but here's the point I want you to I want you to take away. <clears throat> Honestly, there is no other opportunity which rightfully belongs to Canada of this scale <clears throat> that I can think of. It's it's absolutely our greatest uh, national asset. Um, so let me give you some, some very specific examples of what's going on in the, uh, in the ocean economy. Um, this is a, uh, uh, on the left-hand side, sorry, on the left-hand slide is a traditional uh, example of the aquaculture activity uh, in South America, off of both coasts of Canada and in Norway, an industry that was spawned in Norway. Um, uh, these are our salmon cages, and that industry in Norway last year was $15 billion. Uh, the right-hand side is where Norway wants to take uh, that industry, and they've got a plan in place to take that $15 billion industry 
to $50 billion. That's a growth of $35 billion over the course of the next 15 or 20 years. And it is going to manifestly change how aquaculture is done. Today, arguably, it's not a sustainable business because you have to feed fish to grow fish. Uh, all the growth, uh, by the way, in, uh, in, in, in protein from the world's ocean is coming from aquaculture. The world's wild fisheries are essentially tapped out. There's some ups and downs, but, but essentially all the growth is coming from aquaculture. Uh, and as we learn how to farm uh, the ocean, obviously we've got to do it in a sustainable way. So the challenge, if you like, before the global aquaculture industry, and by the way, if it's $35 billion in, in Norway, the opportunity is to do that in multiple locations around the world. <coughs> but we're going to, the, the, the technology, the R&D that has to go into doing what's on the right-hand side of the, of the picture here, you've got to move these cages offshore, you've got to figure out uh, what new source of protein you're going to feed these fish, you've got to ha figure out how to husband them and nurture them on a, in a remote way. Just enormous, enormous challenges, but coupled with that, uh, huge opportunity. Um, so um, these are uh, the bad guys uh, here, and I say the bad guys uh, because uh, the shipping industry is responsible for 15% of the world's uh, sulfur uh, dioxide emissions, and in Europe alone, in Europe alone, there's a great article on the FT about two weeks ago on this, <coughs> cruise ships account for 10 times, 10 times the amount of cancer-causing gases that come from the entire automobile industry. Right? <coughs> so this is a huge problem. Uh, there are regulations in place that are going to force uh, the shipping industry to clean up its act. Uh, <coughs> and again, if you think about, about opportunity generally, this is feeding of fuels to this industry on a global basis, it's $100 billion, right? It's $100 billion. <coughs> I mean, these, these opportunities are massive in scale. So we, uh, uh, as part of that sort of prolific investing front, have, have got some money invested in a couple of companies, and actually in Alberta. Chen's helping us with one of them. Thinks we're crazy, but, but that's okay. Um, designed to try to uh, help, help this problem. Um, but again, there are, this is the, the reason why I like these kinds of opportunities, if you sort of think about investing generally, what do you want to do? Do you want to invest in a business where the market's small and there's only, only going to be one winner? Or do you want to invest in an industry opportunity <coughs> where there's going to be, where the scale is massive and there can be multiple winners? That's this kind of opportunity here. Um, <coughs> this is um, uh, an example of, of two autonomous vessels. Uh, the one on the right is obviously a big ship, the one on the left is small. But again, the opportunity here in autonomous uh, uh, operations of, of vessels is, again, just massive. The company on the left, X-Ocean, is actually a CDL stream company. It's here. Uh, you're going to hear about it uh, this afternoon. And just to give you an example of the applications here and the opportunity for, uh, uh, for, for this sector of the industry, <coughs> So we've got an application before the ocean cluster uh, in which an applicant wants to do something. doesn't really matter what. Of, that, of their $20 million application, $6 million is vessel time to essentially tow stuff around so it can gather data. Right? And, and using vessels like you see on the left-hand side, you could take that $6 million down to probably $500,000. So just enormous savings. But more important, there is so much we don't know. The seal population in Atlantic Canada eats one and a half times as many calories as the entire Canadian population. But if you ask somebody exactly what do they eat, where do they eat it, what's happening with the population, we don't really know. We, we don't really know. So <clears throat> the opportunity to use autonomous vessels such as you see on the left to carry out things like environmental mo uh, monitoring. So when uh, uh, an offshore oil company today wants to uh, drill in Atlantic Canada, the first thing they have to do, and really they have to do this everywhere in the world, is carry out a significant uh, environmental monitoring scheme. Well, how do they do that? Right? Uh, and the answer is uh, vessels uh, like on, on, on the left. Just, and, and it's, um, as I say, that opportunity is, is very broad-based. Aquaculture operations, uh, weather reporting, 
uh, current movement, just huge things happening anecdotally from my sort of exposure to the ocean. Huge things are happening with current that is absolutely going to impact on weather conditions. Right? It's absolutely going to uh, uh, impact on what's happening in the, in the water column. But we know very little about what, what, what is going to happen. We have no real time monitoring. Vessels like you see uh, up here are going to absolutely uh, change that. So um, if, B sills, if Bill C-69 um, <laughs> doesn't sort of shut this industry down in its tracks, let's hope it doesn't, um, the offshore opportunity in, in Atlantic Canada for hydrocarbon development is fantastic. And I, you know, I don't want to get into an argument about climate change, but my own personal position on this is the world is going to consume what it's going to consume in hydrocarbons, which is not, say, not saying we don't have to re remove, move to renewables, but it's our obligation as Canadians to maximize that wealth opportunity for us uh, while we still can. So there's th this is a huge... We have literally got billions and billions of dollars of interest by the world's major oil companies in areas off Atlantic Canada that are some of the most challenging areas in the world in which to undertake uh, this kind of activity. Very, very hostile environments, deep water, remote, and the opportunity for R&D uh, to come in and help the oil industry solve some of these problems so we can exploit these resources is massive. Absolutely uh, massive. <coughs> um, the one on the left is obvious, but I'm not sure how many of you understand uh, that off Atlantic Canada, we have some of the best uh, uh, potential sites in the world for these large wind farms. One of our businesses is, uh, is an offshore support vessel operation, and we've got a, a ship in Spain right now <coughs> that is helping installing a very unique revolutionary anchoring system so you can build these very large seven and a half megawatt wind, terms, uh, wind farms in remote locations in very deep water with very sophisticated anchoring systems. Uh, and there's just a huge amount of money pouring into this. One of the big challenges for this industry, particularly in Atlantic Canada, is how do we get this electricity to market in a cost-efficient way, right? That's a big challenge. That's an enormous R&D opportunity. On the right, <coughs> that's an, um, um, a uh, turbine, an in-water turbine, uh, meant to try to harness some of the tidal activity you see. Again, the Bay of Fundy's got the largest uh, tides in the world. Uh, and we're going to figure this out. Right? I don't know when we're going to figure it out. Uh, Chris Huskelson and Amira was brave enough to, to put um, 25 or $30 million into, if not uh, a device like this, one just like it. Um, and we're going to get there. But again, <coughs> just an enormous opportunity to develop uh, new sources of uh, renewable energy uh, right on our doorstep. Um, here's uh, an example of uh, the kind of R&D that is taking place in various silos in Atlantic Canada at the moment. And just to give you a sense of the scale of this, so the Bedford Institute of uh, Oceanography here on the left, this is where Canada conducts all of its ocean-related R&D. And that budget is over $300 million a year. Right? Between Dalhousie and Memorial, their ocean-related research activity, over $100 million a year. Uh, down here on the right, uh, Irving Shipbuilding, that's a $35 billion contract. So <coughs> my point is that, that th if you take this all together as a collective, the, that collective represents the second largest concentration of ocean-related PhDs in the world. That's why Atlantic Canada is a place to come and carry out uh, ocean research. And of course, uh, we at CDL have, uh, have an enormous role uh, to play in all this, um, simply because, um, in my view, as Jeff said, somebody has to form a catalyst here. Somebody has to provide a mechanism for this R&D to take place and com help commercialize it. And I can't think of a better agent or agency or institution than CDL uh, to try to, uh, because these problems are not going to be solved by big companies, right? These problems are going to be solved by the com kinds of companies that we see come through our various streams. This is where innovation really happens. Uh, so we've got just an enormous opportunity here um, at CDL Atlantic. Uh, we're going to have half our stream uh, focused on, on ocean-related companies in the spring, uh, or uh, yeah, in the fall of this year, sorry, and then we hope to have an entire uh, ocean stream um, by uh, this time next year. So my point is that, look, <coughs> uh, 
come to Atlanta, Canada. There's a lot of stuff happening. This is an enormous opportunity across. I don't know of an industry, if you like, or series of industries that speaks across uh, the kinds of opportunities that, uh, that the ocean economy does. So let me end uh, with this sort of a bit of a, a humbling comment. So it's a uh, fabulous song. When you get old, you know, you sort of get a bit um, uh, into yourself and you pay attention to music. And there's a, a song that many of you are, are too uh, young to, to, uh, to know of called I Hope You Dance. Right? And it's, it starts with um, uh, I hope you never lose your sense of wonder and goes on to I hope you still feel small when you stand behind when you stand beside the ocean amen thank you very much